Hello and welcome to the monthly Southwest Drought Briefing. I'm Emily Elias, Director of the USDA Southwest Climate Hub. These monthly briefings are organized by the Drought Monitoring and Reporting Team of the Southwest Drought Learning Network. Next slide, please, Joel. The Drought Learning Network links climate service providers with resource managers and resource managers with one another to increase landscape and community resilience in current and future drought. These briefings um, started over a year ago and will continue as long as there are areas of extreme or exceptional drought in the southwestern United States. And as you can see on the map here, things have improved, um, but we still have those areas of extreme and exceptional drought. I want to take a moment to thank my colleague, Joel Lisenby. Joel is the Drought Early Warning System Coordinator for the Intermountain West and Southern Plains regions at NIDIS. Joel will be moderating the questions at the end of the briefing, and please use the question feature at any time during the talks. If you have a question, even that's on your mind now, please go ahead and include that and we'll answer it at the end of the webinar. We begin this webinar by respectfully acknowledging that the land each of us is joining from today is the ancestral lands of indigenous cultures. I believe it's important to provide this acknowledgement because the narratives of our land and region have long been told from one dominant perspective without acknowledgement of history and the people who lived here in the past. Next slide, please. Today we have two speakers from the National Drought Mitigation Center. Um, next slide, please. Deb Bathke will provide the drought conditions update Deb is a climatologist with the National Drought Mitigation Center and an author of the U.S. Drought Monitor. She's been with the center since 2008. And prior to coming to NDMC, she served as the Assistant State Climatologist for New Mexico and chaired the Straits Doubt Drought Monitoring Working Group. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Deb and then we'll have a brief introduction of Kelly at the end of Deb's talk. Thanks. Okay, can you guys see that okay? Yes, looks good. Wanted to check. So we'll start with looking at the most recent map of the US Drought Monitor, and Emily already showed this. We can see that conditions have improved, but we do still see some of those areas of extreme and exceptional drought in the Southwest. Um, just a reminder that a new map will come out on Thursday morning. I don't expect anyone to read all of this, but I always like to point out that if you scroll down below the map on the US Drought Monitor website, there is a summary of conditions, a national summary, and then it's broken down into regional descriptions of why changes were made to the map that week. So I just wanted to highlight a few things that relate to the South or to the West and particularly the Southwest. So last week's author, um, Brad Pugh, pointed out that um, in the summary that December was wet, had beneficial snow across the West, but since January, there's been a high pressure system near the West Coast that in effect blocked storms and led to drier than normal conditions across the West. So some of the improvement that we've seen has, has stopped. And what this really has done is kind of put the West in a waiting game. You know, we had some improvements and I was author a couple weeks ago and it's just waiting to see is the current dryness that we're seeing in the West, is it going to continue and be bad enough that it kind of flips the switch to start worsening drought conditions again or not? Um, what we saw specifically for states on the map last week was that in Utah, there has been a slight increase in severe drought, and that was based on some of those shorter term precipitation shortfalls, and then also the effect on stream flows being in that lowest, um, the 10th percentile, so the lowest 10 on record for that part of the state. And then in California, um, 
they haven't made any big no degradations were made last week but um again it's that waiting game it's seeing you know we've had persistent dry weather above normal temperatures snowpacks decreasing and when is it enough to flip that switch or to cause the map to start to show degradations again Oops. so what i point out here this is just for a perspective for the west as a whole from the start of the water year we have seen a decrease across all of the categories on the u.s drought monitor so d0 to d4 decreased on all of them if we look specifically at the southwest um, we've had a had a decrease there but a little bit overall increase just a slight increase in the abnormally dry conditions I mentioned earlier was that the improvements took place um, earlier in the year. They took place in December. And one thing that really struck me was looking at the US drought monitor change map. You can get those for one week, for four weeks, for several months, up to a year. And I looked at that from um, the, the first part from January to December. And we can see when all of those changes took place across the Western US, we're seeing one over that one month time period, seeing you know one and two, two class improvements, even some three class improvements in the Southern part of California that were made due to that, uh, due to some storms that came through in, in part of December. Once January hit, it seems like the, tap was shut off, so to speak. And if we look over the last month from February to January, looking at the map that's on the right, um, we haven't seen a lot of changes on the map, maybe some dryness. One thing that really stood out to me was looking at New Mexico here, that um, they seem to be a different story from the rest of the Southwest and the West, whereas They've, seen, they've continued to see degrade, degradations, particularly in the eastern part of the state. Um, and this just shows it over the full, um, over the last three months, seeing how much degradation we've seen, particularly in New Mexico, whereas most of the rest of the West has seen some improvements due to those um, mid And, um, and you guys maybe have seen this, I don't remember when the last briefing was, but just showing where we were in terms of, of the snowpack and snow water equivalent across the West a month ago, due to those storms that came through in December, things were looking pretty good across parts of the West. It was that snowfall was enough to bring things up to near normal, even above normal in some places, except for parts of Arizona and New Mexico. But one month later, since that high pressure system has been in place and really you know, blocked the storms or steered the storms away from the Western US, we've seen those numbers continue to fall with, you know, whereas we were looking in January, the water year was looking pretty good with these near normal, slightly above normal conditions. Now we've fallen back to below num below normal in a number of basins. It just this time series here from the Drought Monitor website, and that's droughtmonitor.unl.edu, or you can also find it on drought.gov. Um, you can get time series that give you a little bit longer perspective of what drought has looked like, and this is for the Southwest Climate Hub region. And two things really stand out to me. If we look at the history of the drought monitor, which started in January of 2000, all the way to today, the Southwest hasn't been free from drought over that whole time period. Certainly we've had areas such as the early 2000s and then the 20 teens where you know, drought has been more intense and more severe than at other times, but there's been continuous dryness throughout that the whole region over the last um, 22 years. The other thing that stood out to me is that this most recent 
most recent period of extreme and exceptional drought has covered a much larger percent of the land than the earlier periods in the record. So here we are at the, the peak of that. We had nearly 80% um, of the Southwest in extreme to exceptional drought versus much lower percentages in the earlier record. So, you know, the early 2000 drought, which when I was working in New Mexico, I started in 2005, and that was considered what we call our drought of record. Like that was the really bad drought that we compared things to, but now we seem to have, we have surpassed what those values are. So for the drought outlook, so now we've, we looked at the current conditions. Now let's see what the, um, the outlooks, which are created by the Climate Prediction Center from NOAA. And they show that for the Southwest, things are not likely to get better. We see the brown shading there that shows that drought is expected to persist and even get more development in some parts of um, southern New Mexico and in Arizona. They base these off of the broad scale um, atmospheric and ocean and ocean patterns as long and trends that we see in climate data. Those are the drivers of it. And so for the Southwest, when we look at these outlooks, we can look at different time periods. If we look at when I'm doing the drought monitor, one of the things I look at and I write about is what can we expect over the next week? And so conditions at any of these time scales for the Southwest don't look great over the next six to 10 days, continue to see, um, expected to see higher odds of above normal temperatures and below normal precipitation. If we go out to eight to 14 days, those probabilities aren't as strong, but that same expectation is there. Um, warmer than normal, drier than normal. That's what we expect. And looking out for the whole month, um, we still see the same general pattern. And um, I hesitate to show this map because it's got lots of crazy graphs on it, but this is the Climate Prediction Center's forecast by um, month for the whole next year. So, you know, they have lower and lower reliability the further out in time you go. But in looking at this, um, it doesn't look like there is a whole lot of positivity on the horizon for the Southwest. So we'll have to wait, wait and see what changes in our current weather pattern to see if we get some relief. So with that, I will turn it over to Kelly and I'm hoping her news is much better than my news and it'll certainly be more exciting. Thank you, Deb. Thanks for that presentation. We're really lucky to have Dr. Deb Bathke with us and she's a great person um, to pepper with questions. So if you have any, please put them into the Q&A box. Um, She's one of the few drought monitor authors across the country, actually. There aren't many people that, that work on that. They, they work in a rotation. And so we're very lucky to have her here. Thanks, Deb. And we're also very lucky to have Kelly Smith. Um, she's one of the original employees of the National Drought Mitigation Center. So she works alongside Deb. And that center was established in 1995 at the University of Nebraska. And as you saw, uh, the Drought Center is the academic partner and web host of the U.S. Drought Monitor, which we just saw a few times. Kelly's research there focuses on the effects of drought, including how we can gather grassroots information about people's experiences with drought. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kelly to talk about um, see more drought. Thank you, Emily. Are you seeing the right screen and able to hear me? Yes, it looks great. Okay, thanks very much. Um, the two maps that you see in front of you are examples of our Seymour Drought Information Collection System, Condition Monitoring Observer Reports, Seymour for short, help us see more drought. Um, 
each dot that you see on each of these maps is there because somebody took a few minutes to enter a report um, and tell us what they were seeing. Sometimes they include photos, uh, sometimes they include free text descriptions. We'll get into that a little bit more. The map on the left is 2022, this year so far. Um, we're very early in the year and in the growing season. Not much has happened yet. It's kind of a blank canvas. Um, the map on the right is the past four years that we've been doing this, all of the years on one map, 2018 through 2021. You can see that in Missouri, there was kind of an all out effort that was in 2018. That state was very, got really good spatial coverage of uh, what was going on on the ground. All of those reports came within about a four or six week period in late summer. Georgia in 2019 was similar. Producers were kind of feeling a tight spot. They had a flash drought emerge late in the year. And as they called extension and the Cattlemen's Association, state climatologist looking for any help, they said, you know, put a report on the map, you know, go here, file your report. And it ends up being a very efficient system, a good way to kind of give people a voice in the process with some of what we heard to funnel reports directly onto a map where they get used. And then finally, North Dakota last year was a very good example of people reporting over time. Um, actually about more than half of all the reports that we got in 2021 were from North Dakota. And it doesn't look like there are that many, but that's because each one of those points has several reports associated with it. That was, they got extension agents um, who work with livestock to report regularly over time, which is actually kind of ideal to get that picture over time instead of coming in in clusters during what one person calls the stress points. So the way this works, we're, we're really careful um, not to get out ahead of states. We provide the infrastructure, but typically people report when someone in uh, within their state or within an organization that they're part of says, let's all do this, this would be helpful. So um, we anticipate that um, people are more likely to report if they're part of say a cattleman producer organization or an extension network, or if the news media are saying submit reports to the Seymour system, uh, that's typically how they get into the system. And then state drought assessment teams that provide information to U.S. drought monitor authors typically look at those and take them into account as they're providing information recommendations to drought monitor authors. Drought monitor authors can also easily view them directly. That's part of the advantage of this particular system. Someone enters a report and then it's immediately visible on a public map. So if you want to learn more about the entire system, uh, this is the Seymour landing page. I'm sorry, I should have included the URL here. It's go.unl.edu slash Seymour underscore drought. I think that will appear somewhere else. Um, the landing page is a place where you can view reports um, on maps that have been submitted. You can submit a report uh, on your browser. You can use the QR code to pull up the app and submit a report on your phone. Uh, the, the, um, the archive includes reports from all the past years. The fact sheet and the video can help you get started. If it's a presentation similar to the one I'm giving now um, on the video. And the fact sheet has especially information for getting going on using the app. It does work really well on a mobile app once you get the app installed and the, and the uh, survey downloaded. It's not terribly difficult. So the first thing uh, going through the submit a report process, the first thing it asks you to do is to pick a language. The current choices are English or Spanish. Then there is a location widget. Um, there are several different ways you can uh, define a location. One is just by typing it in. You can type in your city or your county and that will be close enough. It doesn't have to be more precise than that. Um, you can touch the compass to let it find you. That does not work if you're on a browser with a VPN, because the VPN could be coming from anywhere. Um, but if you're, especially if you're using the mobile app, it can be quite precise. In fact, if you're using the mobile app, um, it will automatically pinpoint your location if you allow it to see your location. Um, and so you may want to override that and type it in if you prefer not to have your location pinpointed. Or you can move the map and position the marker on the map that way. There's also a location quality control step. We ask people to select their state and county. Um, this does not position the marker on the map, but we do periodically 
every every so often we get markers that are out in the middle of the ocean or turn out to be in a wrong state and this at least lets us assign the report to the correct county during a quality control process the default date is the current date but you can also change it if you know you've had the photos for a couple days and it's taking you a while to get to your browser to submit a report we ask people how dry or wet it is this is the same seven point dry to wet scale that coco ross uh, observers use there's a question that puts current conditions in context of what people have previously experienced and how much experience they have in a place and this lets us uh, we're not yet using this information but collecting this data will enable us to categorize experiences in the same sort of uh, frequency of recurrence approach that the US drought monitor uses. Then we ask people to report on normal or wet conditions. This block of questions is new this year. We've been advocating all along that people report at regular intervals, uh, weekly or monthly, but we didn't really have questions for them that weren't uh, skewed towards the dry side. So now there are some, some check boxes for them to tell us what normal or wet conditions look like. Then we have impact checklists for many different sectors, including crop and livestock production, health, uh, household impacts, and all of these sectors have been devised in conversation with various stakeholders and user groups. If you click on the triangle to expand uh, a sector, you get a checklist of specific impacts for that sector, and they all have the other option at the bottom where you can write something in if we've miss something that you're experiencing. The crop production impacts this year have the same uh, very poor to excellent questions that uh, the USDA uses for their crop condition reporting. There are also questions about planting status and harvest status. Livestock production similarly has individual impacts to check off and it asks about range conditions um, on the very poor to excellent scale same that USDA uses. Then there's an option for people to upload photos um, and we do ask that people own the copyright to the photo that they're using not just find something on the internet and upload it but you know it's it's assumed that you're the photographer or you have the photographer's permission. Then there are some questions about identity. People can identify themselves by role or by a display name and the display name is really helpful when there's a cluster of reports and you want to see if they're all from the same person or not and then we don't publicize name and email although someone could choose some people do choose to have the name of their ranch appear as their display name or their name uh, other people prefer to remain anonymous and then you can go then you click submit you can go find your dot on the map this is a good example of someone who actually took the trouble to upload a before and after photo uh, last year was a dry year and the year before that was more normal. So you can see that the vegetation along that same stretch of road looks quite different from year to year. So the reports appear on a dashboard. Uh, first view is year to date, US drought monitor layer is on. Uh, it lets you filter directly to reports with photos. These are all, I, I like this, this submitted by MED Agronomy. These are from Kansas, these are all from this same organization they're making use of the display name there to show us uh, who they are and that's helpful uh, there's a legend uh, it's the dry to wet scale the u.s drought monitor scale layers you can turn on and off the default layers are overview and the u.s drought monitor in this case i've turned those off and turned on crop production so this is just showing you reports that have a crop production impact identified then we also have a web app for a little bit deeper dive, a little different functionality from the dashboard. When you go to the web app, there's a time slider that lets you control time. And then you have these impact filters that really let you take a deep dive. In this case, I have turned off by clicking on supplemental feed, which is one of the impacts that people can check off under livestock production this is now only showing impacts that have identified having to use supplemental feed so that's that's the kind of thing that'll let you dive down into uh, some of the next steps are to um, we've actually developed this so that states or agencies can customize it for their own purpose and still have the data flow back into the main survey and we can talk more if if people want to explore that option and then of course finding out who wants to partner with us, expanding the on-the-ground networks. Um, 
and begin to work with users more on how to um, develop credibility ratings. So that's what I've got. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Joel here. I'm going to jump in and help uh, moderate some of these questions. Um, we, there was one question asking about the, uh, the recording of this webinar. I'm going to drop the chat into the chat box right now that you should be able to see. Uh, in a few days, we'll post the recording of this onto grout.gov and you can, you'll be able to find that there. Okay, so now some, some actual questions to the, about the content. My first one's for Deb. Um, as a drought monitor author, how much do you consider drought impact reports, for example, from the Seymour drought reports that Kelly just talked to us about? We get, um, we get a summary of those reports um, the Friday before our shift and then the Tuesday during our shift. Tuesday is the data cutoff day for the map. And, and we do look at them. We're able to pull in the um, Kokoraz condition monitoring as well to see what people on the ground are saying about the drought conditions. But those, those reports alone will not change the map. Um, to have data drive the map. So um, how they help us is that if we get kind of a mixed signal with the data, with the drought monitor, we use what we call a convergence of evidence. And that means is the majority of the data, what story is the majority of the data telling us? And it would be great if all of the data that we had always pointed to the same drought status. It doesn't always do that. And so where those condition monitoring reports come in can help us determine if we're kind of on the fence as to which status to put an area in. Does that answer your question? If not, let uh, me know. No, it does. I think if I understand right, and I were to put that in my own words, it sounds like you're saying that the impact reports essentially give you an idea of what part of the country to dig deeper into the data, it, let, letting you know where people are seeing impacts, and then you go and look at if there's data to support that. Is that, is that that's correct? Quite, yeah, that is a, that's, that's one of the ways, definitely. Um, right. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. So I've got a question here about long-term aridification. So what is the possibility or probability that large sections of New Mexico and Arizona are just on this downward trend and they're going to become more arid than they are? Um, I'm not sure exactly. That probably be directed at, at you, Deb. Um, do you have some insight on that? Well, because of the way that the drought monitor works, it uses what we call what's the called the percentile method. So it compares, and you can feel free to pop something else in the chat box or send me a question if I'm not able to answer it in the amount of time that we have left. But basically, it takes all for each um, time period and piece of data that we look at it essentially just puts them in a ranked order from most to least, and then we, where it falls within that ranking is assigned a certain drought monitor category. So what was, um, what's a drought right now may, or what was a drought, you know, 20 years ago when the first drought monitor started may not, the intensity may not look the same now because of that method, because each, record is extended. So eventually we could, you know, with a, with um, a ratification, you know, eventually that record changes and what's considered, you know, for a, D, a D4, which is exceptional drought, has to be in 100 years the lowest and second lowest on record. So eventually that Change. Does that make, I don't, I, I have a hard time explaining this without pictures. I'm using my hands, but no one can see that, so that doesn't help. No, no, that's fine. I think what you're saying is that the way that you are using the, st the, the statistics for the region, it takes into account that long-term trend. So when you're using the percentiles, 
um, and you're, when you're using the percentile method, that'd be using the entire record at the location or right. of the data you have. So that would be incorporated. So sort of downward trends in precipitation, it should be incorporated in those statistics, just the way the and, statistics are. Right, and most of the statistics, yeah, that's incorporated. And then, you know, you can see changes too. I, you know, big news a year ago was the change in the climate normal period of mm -hmm. record. So eventually that climate normal period that like when you consider percent of normal precipitation, that would become drier and drier too as that moves forward in time. So, you know, the most recent normal is 1990 to 2020 that we just switched to. Prior to that, it was 1980 to 2010. So the statistics take those into account. Great. Thanks. Next question is for you, Kelly. What would be the ideal frequency of reporting for a site and what seasonal timing is most useful? I would say perhaps monthly, well, weekly is ideal, but if that is inconvenient, I would say weekly during the growing season and monthly during, uh, you know, in this part of the country, this time of year, not much is going on. So monthly during less important times. Right. So Kelly, I would like to add the not much is maybe going on in terms of precipitation, but if temperatures are warmer than normal, that can have. And yes. I mean, not much yes. is going on in terms of, of maybe the growing season, but in terms of snowpack and temperature and things like that. So I guess it depends on what sector you're in and what your perspective is. Right. It depends on whether you want to report on moisture in the environment or on the effects on vegetation or, or what you're observing. So in some ways, that's up to the expertise of the person to determine. But, you know, honestly, at least monthly, ideally weekly is our general answer. Okay. okay. So that also highlights something that you mentioned, Kelly, and that is that you, you would really like to see these reports not just during really dry times. But if somebody were reporting regularly, they would be reporting both during the wet and the dry period. Is that correct? That is correct, especially with photos. Um, we also, we have a kind of a sister product, the Visual Drought Atlas. We export any photos that we get from the Seymour project into the Visual Drought Atlas. We also separately display the photo. You know, the photos are very valuable for Seymour, but it's also very, um, helpful to have reference photos. You know, people say it's dry, look at how dry it looks. And if you aren't familiar with that landscape, you don't know. So having a normal and a wet photo from the same place is very helpful. Great. Um, we have one comment. Uh, it's not a question, it's a comment that's come in. So something that Deb talked about was how there was a lot of precipitation at the end of December, but the rain sort of, or the precipitation sort of turned off for a few months. Well, Steve in Western Colorado says that they're getting a good amount of snow right now, some snow they haven't seen since December. So we're happy about that. Um, glad that snow is coming. Um, one last question that should be a, a quick one, and then we'll try to wrap up. Um, I'm going to I'm going to summarize the question by simply asking: Are there considerations um, for changes in hydrogeology, for example, from mining or fracking or I, I would almost extend that to any sort of anthropogenic intervention into the landscape. Does that come into account when you're considering drought conditions? That is something that maybe, I'm assuming that question's for me. I'm sorry. I just yeah, sorry. I, I probably should point it to you, Deb. Yes, thank you. Um, I would say it's not directly in the data that we look at but it may come in indirectly through the local experts. Um, I don't make the map by myself when I'm up as author. I send out several drafts to a listserv that has you know, 400 plus people on it. Not all of them answer at every time, um, mm -hmm. particularly if they're not in drought, but that network extends beyond that 400 because each of those people may be part of another network of individuals. So we can, we do get feedback from our points of contact for states on, you know, sometimes on things like that, saying that, well, the data is showing this, but here's what's happening. Mm -hmm. you know? 
Great. Thank it would you. be impossible for me to know all of that for, I wish I could, for the whole country, so. Great. Well, thanks for that summary, Deb, and thanks for your, your presentation. Uh, I'm going to pass back to Emily to wrap us up. Great. Thanks, Joel. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Deb. I see there was another uh, question in, in the um, in the Q&A box about uh, would uploading historic photos be helpful? And I'm imagining that that's probably yes. Kelly, do you have a quick answer to that one? Yes. Um, and people can email me or submit to the Visual Drought Atlas in addition to Seymour. Visual Drought Atlas may be more appropriate for historic photos. Okay, great. Um, and, and I dropped our email addresses in the chat. So if you want to reach out to me or reach out to Joel, we can put you in touch with Kelly and, and facilitate that happening. Um, our next Southwest drought briefing will be the first week of April, and we're going to focus on snowpack and stream flow prediction for this next year. Um, a recording of this briefing, as we mentioned, will be on drought.gov, and it'll also be on the Drought Learning Network website. If you have any additional questions for the speakers or for um, Joel or myself, please direct those to our email addresses in the chat. And this concludes our February Southwest Drought Briefing. Thanks so much for attending and we'll talk to you in early April.